All right, I've got a wonderful jacket. Yeah, give her a hand. This jacket was left out on the bench outside Deeds Hall about three weeks ago. So if you know whose it is, let me know. Otherwise, I'm going to give it to someone who can use a, a good jacket. Um, tonight's Friday Night Frenzy is the camp trip tonight. Um, so uh, that'll be a blast. Tonight's volleyball game is the last home volleyball game. It's senior night. Um, come out and support them and support Kaylee. Is she here? Over there. All right. It's her senior night, so it comes out for that. Um, if you are a senior, you better be getting your grad application in. Okay, if you do not get your grad application in, you will not walk next May. You'll have to wait till the following May. All right. So if you are a senior, get that in, get it done. Um, Wednesday is Dean's inspection in the dorm. Okay, so don't forget that. And uh, I'm also going to give you a quick fall notice for those of you that are living in the dorm. As with any multi-unit residential area, as the weather begins to cool, so does uh, the inside stay warm. The things that we do not want in the dorm have a tendency to want to come to the dorm, i.e. bugs. So it is vital as we get them coming into cool, cooler air that uh, you keep your rooms clean, keep your floors vacuumed, keep the crumbs up off the floor and the countertops, window sills, your beds, whatever, for those of you that eat crackers in bed at night, right? And um, so, <laughs> did I catch them? But, uh, uh, so just keep your rooms clean. We do spray the buildings for bugs in the summer, um, but we can't spray them again um, in a good way, as good solid, the whole building until Christmas when you go home. So, um, so if you do see a bug in the hallway, that's good, because if it's dead, that means the poison's working, okay? <laughs> that's good. Um, and this is the time of year when you'll probably see them in the stairwells and stuff, so uh, just... Uh, deal with it and know that that's happening. As far as ants go, we could spray that building every day. I'm getting a lot of feedback up here. We could spray the building every day and you will still have ants, okay? The best way to do with ants is just go to the Dollar Tree, buy yourself a can of ant spray, spray the perimeter of your room, and spray around your sink and just keep them at bay. Send them to the room next door who won't go get a can of spray, okay? Um, because with ants, you're gonna, you could spray your room once a week and you may still get them. Um, so just uh, have a can of ant spray in your room and uh, keep, them, keep them back with whips and chairs. All right. Um, we're going to today. Um, that's all I had. So um, as far as announcements, it's just that time of year when not a whole lot's going on as far as announcements go. We're kind of just after midterms, and I know all of you aced your midterms. You've all got your midterm projects in, and um, I haven't seen a single student walking through the halls like this in, in a week and a half. So uh, I know that all is good. So uh, I just wanted to encourage you all today, um, and um, I'm going to be in 1 Samuel 16 today if you want to follow along. 1 Samuel 16. And in 1 Samuel 16, at the beginning of this chapter, we see Samuel, who is just pouting and moping around because King Saul has uh, had the Spirit of God lifted from him. And Saul is really kind of bummed out, or Samuel's bummed out about that, and he's moping around, and God says, Samuel, and he gives him a proverbial kick in the butt, and he says, get up, and let's do this thing and get, it, get moving on. So he sends them to Bethlehem, and he sends them down there to anoint a new king, now Saul is still king. He's still in Jerusalem. He's still on the throne. It's just that God has left him. And God has just walked away from Saul. So Samuel goes down to Bethlehem, meets Jesse, says, bring me your boys. He brings out all of his boys. And he brings out the oldest one who is strong and tall and strapping and handsome and, yes, I can be your king kind of guy. And Samuel says, no, 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 no. And he goes through all of his sons. 
And Jesse's like, well, God told me you had a son that's king. Where's, is there anybody else? And can you imagine Jesse's face? And he says, well, yeah, we got little ruddy David out here. He's tending sheep. And we just sent him out there to get him out of the way so you could do your own thing. And, just, and Samuel looks at him and says, I'm not sitting down. Nobody in this house is sitting down until you go get David. So they go get David. They bring David in. And he anoints David as king. Now that is totally contrary to what the people wanted. Totally contrary. David was a teenager. He was uh, ruddy, which means he was a pretty boy. He was the kind of guy you'd look at and say, you, I can take you. And that would be the women. Okay. So he was kind of just a, a pretty boy and no, not the kind of person that you and I as people would say, that's what I want to be king. Because we want to see tall and strong and strapping. There's, um, and we're still that way. Why do you think women always want a man that's taller than them? They always want somebody who's bigger and stronger and just, that's the way we think in our own sinful way because we look at the outside. We look at the outside. I've met a lot, of, a lot of men over my lifetime who were under six foot that I don't want to mess with <laughs> because they would, just, they would just kick you. <laughs> we're going to start in verse 14, actually verse 13, and um, we're going to look at these verses. But here in verse 13 and 14, this story is still really not about David. It's about Saul. David is just a sub-point, just a sub-point narrative. And even though that's true, what is happening in David's life is very important that we recognize that God's will for David is actively happening. You see, he had been anointed as king. The Spirit of God came upon him, and what did they look at him and say? Go back to the sheep, boy. And he goes back tending sheep. He has the Spirit of God on him to be king. He's tending sheep. So I thought or believed God had a plan for my life. All of us think that way. When we become Christians, we think that way. And for David, he's thinking that way too. But it doesn't seem to be happening. But you see, kings aren't made in a day. And neither are solid, firm believers. The same is true for you and I. We will not be what God intends us to be overnight. There's a lot of development that must take place. It would be cool, wouldn't it, if when we got saved, when we got down on our face before God and said, God, I'm a wretched sinner. I can't deal with life. I can't do it my way. I need your help. When we did that and we stood up and God went, poof, you are now this. That would be cool. We wouldn't need Bible colleges to train. We would just all automatically be his servants and we would be doing his thing and doing what we need to do. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. Kings are not made in a day, and neither are believers. Let's look at verse 14. It says, Now the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and a harmful spirit from the Lord tormented him. And Saul's servants said to him, Behold now, a harmful spirit from God is tormenting you. Captain Obvious. Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is skillful in playing the lyre. And when the harmful spirit from God is upon you, he will play it and you will be well. King, we need to soothe the savage beast in you, basically. Now we have some theological difficult things here to look at. Things that are happening to Saul right now. Because you see, in James chapter 1, verse 13, it says, Let no one say that when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. It's the same God in James as it was in Saul's day. God doesn't tempt us. It's not God that does that. And even in Matthew, when Jesus is talking about the evil generation, in chapter 12, he says, When an evil spirit leaves a person, it goes into the desert, seeking respite, finding none. And then it says, I will return to the person I came from. So it returns and finds its former home empty, swept, and in order. 
Then the spirit finds even other spirits more evil than him itself, and they all enter that person and live there. And so that person is worse off than before. That will be the experience of this evil generation. So when Jesus was talking about them, Jesus was not saying God is doing it. God is not going to cause the evil generation. The people are going to bring it on themselves. So where are we then? Where are we with Saul and who's tormenting him? If you would go back and look at the book of Job and understand what God did with Job, if you remember at the beginning of Job, we see where God is holding court, so to speak. He's evaluating what's going on and who comes knocking, wanting in, Satan. And Satan comes in and he says, God, give me Job. I know I can torment him and I can pull him from you. And God says, okay, I know Job is strong enough. He can take it. Go ahead. I dare you. But even at that, God only gave him certain things that he could do each time he came back. Satan didn't have carte blanche over him. He couldn't do whatever he wanted. God limited it. We're at the same point here. We're at the same point. Satan, God's given Satan rule over Saul. He's given it to him. A complete opposite picture than Job. The other amazing thing to me is, in Job, when you look at the fact that Satan comes before God and says, God, give me a chance, that wasn't a one-time deal. We get the impression there that that happens all the time, even today. You see, because God is watching over you, and he's watching over all of us, and he's watching this world, and Satan keeps coming in and saying, let me have him, let me have him, because it's not God that tempts us. He allows Satan to tempt us at times because he knows we're strong enough to handle it, or at least he hopes we are. So here's Saul. He's being tempted and tormented. And you see, the residence of God's Spirit is paramount for me being that which you want to be called to be in God. You can't be what God wants you to be without His Spirit. There is a strong contrast here between Saul and David. You see, God's Spirit has been removed from Saul and given to David. Saul can't do squat anymore. David has all of the power of God's Spirit. He's just not ready yet. But you see, when God's spirit is not present, fulfilling his will is impossible. Absolutely impossible. Paul says, be filled with the spirit in Ephesians 5. If you are filled with the spirit, you won't ever have to worry about a bad spirit. That's true. Whether it's of your own, uh, whether it's of you, outside of you, controlling you, the Spirit of God will never lead you into a feeling of failure when the Spirit lives here. It's never God that leads you to that feeling. It's never God that leads you to that feeling of depression or inadequacy. He will fill you with His ability. Think about that. The one thing that did happen when you got off your face before God and gave your life to God, He filled you with His Spirit. It is the same Spirit that was upon David, the same Spirit that was upon Saul. They got it from the outside and over them. We get it from the inside. We get it far more direct. Saul, though disobedient, had lost God's spirit. And David, by God's calling, had gained it. Now let's look at verse 17 here through 23. It says, So Saul said to his servants, Provide for me a man who can play well and bring him to me. One of the young men answered, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, a Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, a man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a man of good presence, and the Lord is with him. It's still the teenager back there. (laughs) He's overselling this a bit. I love it. Therefore, Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me David, your son, who is with the sheep. And Jesse took a donkey laden with bread and a skin of wine and a young goat and sent sent them by David, his son, to Saul. And David came to Saul and entered his service, and Saul loved him greatly, and he became the armor bearer. And Saul said to Jesse, saying, Let David remain in my service, for he has found favor in my sight. And whenever the harmful spirit from God was upon Saul, David took the lyre and played it with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the harmful spirit departed from him. So let's look here at what we know about David. We know he's already been anointed. We saw that in verse 13. David is not looking to begin where he's supposed to end up either. So many times we want to do that. 
So many times we want to do that. We want to begin where we're supposed to end up. It doesn't work that way. You have to get there. The second thing is, David is way overqualified for this job. He's way overqualified. Because it says, one of the young men answered, Behold, I have seen the son of Jesse the Bethlehemite, who is skilled in playing. Well, okay, he's skilled in playing. He could have stopped right there. But what does he do? A man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech and of good presence. There again, he was good looking. He was a pretty boy. And the Lord is with him. Now, the young man here who speaks doesn't speak of David by name. He doesn't mention him by name, but he seems to know a lot about David. He's saying to Saul, this is the guy you are looking for. He has all these great qualities. And oh, by the way, he does play the lyre too, which is kind of good. Now, verse 18, uh, Walter Brueggemann says that he's over-nominated. He's over-nominated. The man who, because with all that he has said, David is apparently way overqualified for this. He's way overqualified for it. And if you know David's story and know that he will be king, you may be thinking, wait. David shouldn't be playing instruments to soothe a king with a bad attitude. He's been anointed king. But David, however, will begin with the opportunity God gives him. There's no pride there. There's no pride there. You see, it takes time. We have to build where we have to build to what we are. Otherwise, it would be like taking a high school senior who's playing football. He's an incredible quarterback. He's going places. We just know someday he's going to win a Super Bowl ring. But instead, we take him. And when he graduates in May, and we say, you go home and sit at home. We'll call you when we need you. And in February, around the 14th or 15th of February, when the Super Bowl happens, we call him and say, come on down to wherever. You're the guy today. You're the quarterback. It doesn't work that way. You have to train. You have to learn. David is understanding that he has to begin with the opportunities that he's given. For those of us here in Christian ministry, what we do in our lives, we all want to be the Billy Graham before we get to be a graduate. Sometimes we want to get the cart ahead of the horse. The other thing is that we see in verse 21 that David serves without question. Verse 21 says, And David came to Saul, entered his service, and Saul loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. Think about that. We know for a fact that David is not the protagonist in this story. It's Saul. David's been anointed king. Put yourself in David's shoes. I've been anointed king. I'm here to replace him. He is on the throne, but I am king in God's eyes. I'm here to replace him. And Saul is the one that is tormented and hateful. If you read on in Samuel, he gets so angry sometimes, he even throws spears at David while David's playing for him. And the spear hits the wall behind David. That's the kind of anger that we're seeing out of Saul as he's driven mad. We don't know what all David knows coming into this. We know that David is, is, there's obviously something wrong, and David knows that, but we don't know how much. You see, Saul, became, Saul because he's already been anointed the next, David's been anointed the next king, and Saul doesn't know that either. Yet, it hasn't changed his approach to Saul. David comes in to his service knowing he's going to replace him. It doesn't change his reverence and respect for the position of king. He does it without question. He serves without question and serves the crazy king. There, um, the second half of verse 22, it says, And Saul, what? Loved him greatly. He was so reliable. He was so committed to his service to this king. Saul begins to love him greatly, begins to trust him. Why? Because it says he became his armor bearer. Not everybody became the armor bearer. For you to be the armor bearer, the king had to trust you 
He had to know that when he put that on and went to battle, the straps were not going to come undone. The panels were not going to separate. It was going to be prepared and ready for a king to enter battle and come home alive. That was not given to everybody because most kings trusted very few people. So he was loved. He was trusted. We don't know how much time elapsed before David is named the armor bearer, but it is significant that he is. This is a position of complete trust. And before God can bring us to a place to trust us, to do his will, to trust us with all he intends for us to be, he must first see that he can trust us where we are. He must first trust us where we are. How long does it take for us to prove our trust to God? God alone knows that answer. But a sure way to know you're not there is to struggle to trust God enough to wait. Is to struggle to trust God enough to, to, is to struggle to trust God enough to wait. Think about that. Are you willing to let God continue to train you in the small things? And are you willing to do the small things to get where God may want you to be? Or you just want to go bypass them and keep going? Because you see in verse 23, it's very clear that David ministered where he was. It said, and whenever the harmful spirit from God was upon Saul, David took the lyre, played it with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the harmful spirit departed from him. Here in verse 23... There's a play on words here. The harmful spirit in verse 23 and the word refreshed are the same root word. It means that they were changed. They were changed and, and made different. In the first one, the harmful spirit was a sense that Saul was changed for the bad. He got the bad temper. He got the ill temper. But when David came in and played his little harp, he was changed back to what he wanted. Sometimes in Scripture... What's not mentioned is just as important as what is. It's interesting what's not mentioned here. There's no mention of David saying, you know what? This is stupid. What am I here for? Why does God have me here for? I'm anointed king. This is stupid. There's no mention of God, David saying, I'm not going to minister to a person who's struggling because he's an idiot. I shouldn't have to do what's beneath me because Saul has personal issues. We don't see any of that. It never happens in the story. Instead, David sees the opportunity to minister to Saul, period. No questions asked. No questions asked. So for us, the challenge is this. To be the person God wants me to be, what do I got to do? What do I got to do? Well, first, I must rely on God's spirit and strength and not my own. I can tell you in America, that's very tough for us. We're self-made people in America. And we don't want to let God be in charge. It may come as a surprise to you how much language about the spirit of God and the ability he brings actually happens even in the Old Testament. God's Spirit working in the hearts of a believer, a person of faith in the Old Testament, wasn't new to the New Testament. The Israelites knew it very clearly, what it meant to be Spirit-driven. Because you see, without God's Spirit controlling my life, my goals will be wrong. My ability to achieve anything worth achieving will be impossible. Absolutely impossible. The second thing I must do is I must begin where I am, not where I want to be. David doesn't see it as a right to bring down Saul's dynasty. Yes, he was anointed king. He didn't see it as his right. It was God's timing, God's place to do that. He's waiting on God to develop him and bring God's own plan to fruition. If David would have went there as a harp player and killed Saul, I guarantee you the, the Spirit of God probably would have left David too. He had been disobedient, just as Saul was. David had to wait, and he was willing to wait. You see, any time I begin to replace God's plan with my own, I run the risk of short-circuiting God's plan for my life. And at that point, if I'm trusting God, I don't have to worry about screwing up either. <laughs> because it's in God's plan. 
The third thing I have to do is I have to live on opportunities given, not by what I'm taking. In other words, I'm seizing opportunities, but not looking for ways to take advantage. How does that happen? We said that God wants us to begin with the small things. Are you even willing, when God gives you the opportunity, maybe at a family gathering or at some other gathering, maybe at work, wherever you are, when somebody says something and it opens the door for you to give a testimony to what God's done, do you do it? Are you taking all of the opportunities that God gives you? Are you asking God to put on Jesus' eyes to you so that when you see people, you see them in the eyes that Jesus sees them with? So that you can have opportunities to minister to them. The server at the restaurant. The cashier at the store. Are you looking at them with Jesus' eyes? Are you just looking at them as, that person's worthless? Are you taking the opportunities that God gives you as they come along? Do you have the attitude of, I'm waiting for God to open doors and give me opportunities to grow to be what he's making me to be? Not trying to create them myself. So many times we ignore the small doors that are opened, but particularly those of us here in Bible college, we're looking for the big ministry opportunities. Give me the big one, yeah, give me the big one. I want to be in charge. And David, David didn't ever move to take Saul's place as king. As you read all of Samuel, he never did. He had opportunities to kill him. He had opportunities to do it. He didn't do it. He didn't take what was his. He let God bring it to him. Fourthly, I live to love the way I wish to be loved. Love God with all and love your neighbor as yourself. Those are our two commands. David did all he could to sue Saul. And think about that. Would you sit there and continue to play a harp for a crazy man who's willing to throw spears at you? (laughs) But he was willing to do it. David did all he could to soothe Saul. He still had the pity. He still had God's eyes when he looked at Saul. At one time, Saul was a great king. When God was upon Saul, Saul did amazing things. And David did all he could to sue them. And by the way, when Jesus died on the cross, he died for his enemies. Because every one of you, before you became a Christian, was his enemy. He was willing to do what it took, even to minister to his enemies. And fifthly, I do more to help others than help myself. The only way to truly be what God desires you to be is to be like His Son. It started on the cross. In that, you and I must put others above ourselves. That's the only way we can be like God. It's the only way we can be like God. It's amazing. When you're helping other people and you're doing things for other people, it's amazing how much your own troubles just don't seem as important. Just don't seem as important. I've watched people over the years as they get mad about something and they stop coming to church or they stop doing the things of God, they become very bitter, angry people. But I've also seen some of them that when they realize it and they get back into helping other people, all that stuff that made them bitter suddenly doesn't matter anymore. I'm going to close with 1 John 2, 6. It says, Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. David was a perfect example of showing us that we need to start with the small things where God puts us. Because you see, if I can't trust you in little things, I'm not going to give you a big thing. If God gives you a small job to do, and right now every Christian's job is to help grow his kingdom, to give our testimony, to let people know what God has done for us. Well, I'm shy and quiet. I don't want to talk to anybody. Well, you know what? When the door opens, take it. Because God just asks you to do it. He will give you the strength. His spirit within you will give the strength to do it. His spirit will guide your words. If you let him do it, and all you do is go through the door, it's amazing. It's amazing what can happen. 
God wants to trust us in the small things before he can trust you with the big ones. And that's whether you want to be in ministry, if you want to be a lawyer, if you want to be a nurse, whatever you want to be, it doesn't matter. We're all called to be ministers of his, whatever career path that takes us. But we cannot be effective ministers for him if we're not willing to do the small things, love others, and let God unfold the plan and follow him. That's my challenge for you today. I hope God, and I know God has great things for all of you. He has a plan for every one of you. Your plan is not to be a lifelong student. He wants you to grow out of here, grow into a career, and he wants you to be effective for his kingdom out there in whatever way it can be. But you have to start with the small things to be able to get the big things. Let's pray. Father God, we just want to come to you, Lord, and let you know how much we love you. God, I, I can't even begin to can't even begin to imagine how many times we break your heart, that you give us little opportunities, and because of our ego or because our lack of faith, but we just don't take them. I want to thank you for this picture of David, who even in the midst of a crazy king, a king that he's to replace, he looked at him, treated him with your eyes. And Lord, I thank you for this example. Lord, I pray that every one of these students, as they're planning for a career, all of them have great aspirations of what they want to be and do. And Lord, I just pray that you would just guide them, direct them. Lord, make their path very clear. But Lord, may they, all the way along, may they be on your plan. May they be following uh, and doing your plan with your spirit and with your strength. And Lord, we just pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. I think there's a couple of announcements. All right, guys. Um, as Kyle said, apparently I'm, ex I'm like super excited and I never get excited, so I'll try to contain it. Um, we have our camp out tonight, guys. I know y'all have heard about it a hundred times if you listen in chapel, so you haven't heard about it. Um, no, um, we would love to have you guys out, um, 9 o'clock or after the volleyball game. One or the other, we'd love to have you support the volleyball team. And after that, we're going to start. Um, we're going to do pumpkin carving. When, 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 you, when you get there, so please show up on time. And please, a bunch of people come. My room is filled with pumpkins. I would like to have my room floor back. Please come. And if, if we can't carve them, we're just going to hit them with a baseball bat. But we're getting rid of them. Um, so that'll happen. And then we have movies. We have games. All right, we're playing Grog, basically. You're going to be running around in the woods being chased by a hideous, hideous creature. All right, Mr. Moore. Um, so please come out to that. We're going to have lots of fun. We have a lot of food, all right? We have a bunch of candy and food. It took three grocery carts and a minivan to get it back, all right? Please come. And I have another announcement. All right, um, next... Next Halloween, this Halloween, not next Halloween. That's a lot of planning. No, this Halloween, two Mondays from now, we are giving we are giving blood, donating blood at um, Open Door Baptist. That is Dr. White's church. So please come come out, support people, all right, and give blood. All right, to do this, you have to call or go online to create an appointment because they can't do 50 people at once. All right, there's flyers in the back for more information. And please, all right, I don't know anything about giving blood, but I'm assuming a certain, there's only a certain amount a person can give, and I'm assuming that that varies on the person's size. And look, it's Dr. White's. It's the same size. Well, I'm assuming that Dr. White's size, he only has so much to give. And like, just he's so small, you can probably, we only can get a thimble out of him, guys. So please come. All right, we would love your support. And Logan, do you have an announcement? All right, Preacher of the Year, y'all. Preacher of the Year. <laughs> okay, so I am up here to announce a blood drive, but I need y'all to still listen. This is a different one, okay? <laughs> so, worst timing ever, but... um. Okay, here's the deal. Everybody look back. You see the beautiful man in the back in the gray shirt? That is Eric Aguilar. All right? Eric has people, and those people um, 
would like Piedmont to sponsor a blood drive. So this is not something that we're going to be doing anytime close to the blood drive that Matt just talked about. Right now, we're just collecting signatures of interest for like next semester sometime, okay? So it's going to be at a time in the future. You're not going to have to give blood two days in a row and pass out and die. Uh, <laughs> This is, this is something that's going to be spaced out. So I know you've heard about two blood drives, but please, you know, pick up the brochure for Dr. White's. But also, if you are interested in giving blood or you think you might be interested in giving blood, please sign Eric's sheet back there. Please do so. It would be good for the school to be able to host a blood drive as we continue to get more involved in the community, right? So go see Eric. You're dismissed. No.